All right, well, welcome to church today. I'm so glad that you're here. And I was thinking about this as uh, I was getting ready to come up here. I've been able to, but throughout my career as a pastor, been able to preach in a lot of different places, been able to experience a lot of different things. And one thing that is true about every place where you find the presence of the Holy Spirit is that there is a focus on what is most important. I've preached in a uh, Zulu village church in South Africa. I, I've preached in a church in a house in Cuba. I, I preached in Germany in a Russian refugee church that was meeting in Germany. I've, I've preached in places all over the world. And one thing that I know, the authentic, the real is what matters. You know, it's not the technology, it's not all of the fancy things, but rather it is getting our focus on Jesus Christ. And I hope that is what we can do as a church, because therein lies the power. Therein lies the ability to change our lives. And uh, so I'm so thankful for all the people that work so hard to make our services uh, possible, our tech, our worship, our Uh, children's ministry, they just do a wonderful, wonderful job. Well, don't forget that after the service today, I'll be meeting down front. For anybody that is interested in going on this missions trip, I'll meet down front right after the service, after both services. So if you're interested in that, you say, well, I may not have the money. Still come. If you're interested, come, and we'll talk about how you raise that money. And uh, I believe this, if you feel called to go, if you want to go, there's no reason you should not go, okay? Uh, because if you trust the Lord, and I believe He can provide, uh, and it's not that uh, difficult, I, I promise you, we had opportunities that you can raise the money and go. Well, we're in the book of Mark, and we're going through and seeing uh, the different stories that God wants for us. And we're applying it to our lives so we can learn how to live uh, God's way. Well, the Gospel of Mark presents Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. And it shows His power and His mission to save. It it shows us uh, really how to live our lives around the truth of the Gospel. Well, today I'm going to preach to you from... Uh, Mark chapter 5, and I'm not going to read the entire uh, chapter for sake of brevity, but in Mark 5, we find three particular stories, and these stories I want to make application to our lives today, and, and maybe you find yourself in these stories. I know I find myself in these stories, but it's three very unique people, very unique stories, but they all point to the power of of Jesus Christ. They point to his ability to save, his ability to heal, his ability to restore. And so I want us to see these three stories today. And the first story is about a man that was demon possessed. Now, a lot of times we don't really experience a lot in that, or we, we're kind of blind to it, or we see it in the movies and we're like, well, that doesn't really happen. Well, it does happen, and it's a very real thing. And here was a man that was, I'm assuming at one point, lived a normal life, okay? And he became demon-possessed, and he began to live in a way that was tragic. And uh, we're going to see his story and beginning in verse number three. Once again, not going to read the entire chapter, just going to read some selected portions about these three stories. And here's the first point that I want you to see about this man, that Jesus has the power to deliver you from your darkness. And here's a man that was in darkness. He was demon-possessed. He was living in a world that was controlled by the devil. And yet Jesus had the power to deliver him. Notice in verse number three, it says, he lived among the tombs. Now think about that. He lived in the place of death. And and whereas there's probably not many people in our culture that actually lives in a graveyard, okay? But how many of us live in the place of death? The place of the dying. The the place where there is no real life. 
Well, that's what this man did. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Well, here's a man that was demon-possessed. Here's a man that was oppressed by the devil himself, okay? And you say, well, uh, pastor, that's not really real. We live in the real world, and that doesn't really happen. It actually does, and my wife and I both have experienced um, the, the power, if you will, of people that are demon-possessed. I've seen it in my ministry. I've seen it over my life. I've seen people that were oppressed or obsessed or possessed or whatever you want to call it uh, with demons. I've experienced this, the incredible power that they have. It's not of their own strength. And this man was living exactly that way. I want you to notice the phrase, he lived among the tombs. He lived in the place of death. And those who are apart from Christ live in the place of death. You've been there. I've been there living in the place of death. Death is simply a separation. That's all it is. Uh, Physical death is separation from your body. Spiritual death is separation from God. And the Bible tells us that because of our sin, because of actually the sin of Adam and how that it has been passed down to all people, that we inherit this spiritual death. And when you are born... You're born in spiritual death. Now, we do not believe that uh, little babies or children that are not old enough yet to understand, they're not yet accountable for their sin. If they die, they go to heaven, okay? But the fact is, you and I have been found guilty, if you will, because of our sin nature. We're born separated from God. That's spiritual death. And yet, what we need is is the power and the touch of Jesus. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. Not just physical death. We all are going to die someday physically. We know that in the Garden of Eden, God told Adam and Eve, He said, look, uh, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because the day that you do, you're going to die. Now, the day they die Physically that day, no, they died spiritually. They died much later physically. The Bible tells us that death has passed upon all people because Adam sinned, because we sin. So our sin separates us from God. It says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you get the difference? Okay, Uh, on the one hand, there is death. On the other hand, there is life. And what God wants you and me to see is this man, and, and you know he was a real person, and it was a real experience, and he experienced the power of Satan, he experienced the power of the devil, but he also experienced the power of life through Jesus Christ. Jesus was able to deliver him, and he can deliver us from our darkness. I want you to think about this for just a second. He lived in the place of death. He lived in the place of demonic control. Now, I think there are some things that we should think about uh, in this. And uh, in living in a place of demonic control like this man did, uh, imagine how depressed he was. And I'll be honest with you, I do believe that there are people that really struggle with depression. And I don't believe it's all just a chemical imbalance. I I do believe that there are some physical reasons, okay? I I, I get that. And there's modern medicine that helps. But let me tell you something. Uh, Not all depression is necessarily uh, physiological in nature. Sometimes it comes from the powers of darkness. It comes from the devil trying to discourage you. I know... In my own life, and I heard someone say this this week, the number one tool of the devil is discouragement. And I tend to agree with that. The fact is, if he can get you depressed, if he can get you discouraged, he will get you not depending on God. He'll get you off track in your life. And so imagine what this man faced with depression. Imagine the destructive behavior in his life. Well, it says he cut himself and he couldn't even be bound by chains. 
You know, there are many of us that have lived in this kind of life. Oh, maybe you weren't bound by chains, and maybe you didn't live in a, uh, in a graveyard, but you had this destructive behavior in your, your life. How many times have we seen that? Someone that uh, they begin to live in a way, maybe with an addiction, maybe with something they do, and they begin to live their life in a destructive way. We even see people do that in their relationships, and it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with drug addiction or alcohol addiction, but rather they begin to be destructive and destroy their own relationships. And once again, I'm not suggesting that everyone that has an argument in their marriage is being oppressed by the devil. Okay, now maybe some are, I don't know. Uh, my grandpa had a heart attack, um, this had been many years ago, and uh, they had, uh, he actually died on the, the operating table. Uh, they had to shock him back to life. And my grandmother was a hysterical person in that she just would fall apart very easily. And so she had heard that he had gone, you know, he, he had died, actually they had to shock him back to life. She came in, my grandpa's name was Wendell, Phillips. And uh, she said, oh, Wendell, she said, uh, I heard that you, you died on the operating table. She said, did you see a light? What happened? He goes, well, no, I just thought I saw the devil. And she goes, oh, no, what happened? He said, I woke up and it was just you. All right. <laughs> now, maybe he was influenced by the devil. I'm not sure. Okay. But the fact is, we all have been in these places where Satan himself will influence with de- us with depression, with destructive behavior. And can you imagine the deception that he faced? This man was deceived. He thought there was no hope. He thought there was no deliverance. He thought there was no way. And yet we find a lot of people live this way. They think there's no hope. They think there's no hope for them, their circumstances, their situation. He was no doubt in isolation. And and I find that often what the devil will do in our lives is he will make us feel totally isolated from everyone. And, And what happens to us when we live in the place of the tombs, when we live in that place of death, we will feel separated. We will feel isolated. We will feel like no one cares. And that is actually a tool of the devil. I want you to read with me in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12. Uh, This is the Apostle Paul writing, and he's talking about putting on the whole armor of God. He said, finally, receive your power from the Lord and from His mighty strength. When you get your power from God, it can overcome all the powers of darkness. Amen? Amen. I'm telling you, God will give you that strength. He says, put on the whole armor that God supplies. In this way, you can take a stand against the devil's strategies. The devil has strategies. He knows your weakness. He knows how to attack you. I know he has worked in my life in this way in the past many times. Uh, He knows my weakness. He knows what gets me discouraged. He knows what gets me depressed. And he will work overtime to try to get me into that place of the tombs, in that place of the dead. But yet, when we put on the whole armor of God, we don't have to live there. He says the devil has strategies. And this is not, and this is what I want you to see, this is not a wrestling match against a human opponent. We're wrestling with rulers, authorities, the powers who govern this world of darkness and spiritual forces that control evil in the heavenly world. What is he saying? He's saying that your fight is not just against your fellow man. It's not against your neighbor. It's not against your kid. It's not against your spouse. But our fight is against the the place of darkness, against the ruler of evil in this world. And he wants to do everything he can to destroy you. He wants to do everything he can to get you off track. That's why Jesus said that he is a liar. He lies to you. He lies to you about what's going on in your life. He lies to you about hope. He lies to you about your future. He lies to you about your past. Jesus said that he is a murderer. And that all he wants to do is 
kill and steal and destroy. He wants to do that, but Jesus came to give you life and to give it to you abundantly. So when you and I are facing this discouragement, this feeling of isolation, once again, I'm not suggesting that there are not physiological reasons, chemical reasons that we face problems, but let's not be too swift to dismiss everything as a physiological or medical issue when we deal, according to Scripture, we're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against the devil himself, against the rulers of the dark forces of this world. He said, well, how do we deal with it? James 4, 7 and 8, so humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. That's a pretty good prescription of how you can get better. That's a pretty good way of how that you can avoid the place of the tombs, like this first person in our chapter today. What do you got to do? You got to humble yourself. You got to admit that you need help. You can't go through life thinking that you've got it. And look, I, I'm one of those people that I am a pull yourself up by your own bootstraps kind of guy. I am a person that believes in hard work. I am a person that believes in self-sufficiency. Don't get me wrong. I believe that we should put forth effort. But let's not make any mistake about this. You don't have the strength to do this on your own. You don't have the strength or the goodness or the ability to earn God's favor. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't even earn the love of God. The fact is, it is freely given to us. And we need God's help in order to get through these difficult and dark times. So he says, humble yourself. Admit to God. Resist the devil. Sometimes we don't do a very good job resisting, do we? It's kind of like, if you are deciding that you're going to eat healthy and you're going to lose some weight, and in order to do that, you go and fill your freezer with bluebell ice cream, all right? Well, that's not a very good strategy, I'm just going to say. That's not, we don't do a very good job resisting the devil sometimes. We do just like what I would like to do whenever it's time for me to start not eating so many sweets. I like to go and stock my freezer full of bluebell ice cream. Not just chocolate, but vanilla and every other kind of delectable, delicious flavor that they have. Now, here's the point. If you want to overcome, you want to get out of this place of darkness, what do you do? You got to resist the devil. You say, well, I've got a drinking problem. Well, don't go to the bars. That, that would make sense, right? Right? A lot of times we do dumb things when it comes to our decisions, okay? Resist the devil, and the Bible says he will flee from you. It's amazing how that works. He does not have the strength apart from God giving him permission to mess with you, okay? You don't have uh, the strength to, uh, to uh, overcome him by yourself, but trust in the Lord, depend on him, but you do have a job. You got to resist. You got to resist. You got to humble yourself and admit you need God's help. And then he says, come close to God and God will come close to you. You know, the interesting thing about this is the closer you get to God, the further away the devil is. You, you want to be able to survive? You want to be able to make it? Draw close to the Lord, okay? Look, it, it, it's not, you know, it's not rocket science. You want to get the devil off your back? You want to overcome temptation. You want to overcome the depression and the isolation and this feeling that uh, you're just overwhelmed. Draw close to the Lord. Begin to resist the devil. The Bible says he will flee from you. Now I want you to see uh, a couple of words uh, in the passage that we read out of Mark 5. Uh, it talks about this man. It says, it uses the word bind and bound and subdue. And he said, why do you point out these words? Well, this shows us the nature of the demonic influence over his life. He was bound. Uh, he was subdued. Um, what, what does this mean? 
uh, it means that what happened in this man's life uh, was demonic. It was spiritual in nature. These words also have a meaning that's connected to spiritual depravity. I want you to get this. Not just physical, but spiritual depravity, immorality, and vice. That's interesting, isn't it? These words in the New Testament, in the Greek language, they're tied to this meaning as well. So this man not only had a physical problem, but he had a spiritual problem. He was... uh, living in immorality. He was living in vice. He he was living in spiritual depravity. In other places, these words are used to mean not to be restrained by law or order. In other words, he was living out of control. He was living where he did not want anyone or anything to be an authority in his life. I want you to get this. You know, it is in our nature to want to rebel against authority, especially spiritual authority. And and particularly in our country, you know, we are founded on freedoms and we're founded on uh, opportunity. But the fact is, often uh, we fail to realize that um, we need to be submissive, submissive to the authority. We need to submit to God. We need to surrender ourselves to Him in order to have victory. You see, a lot of times we think that this idea of freedom is having no restraint. But that's actually not true at all. Um, The fact is, often we see uh, the absence of God's authority in our life as true freedom. But did you know that that that's actually true uh, shackles and being bound and enslaved? I think of many famous atheists that I know. They think that by somehow, if they in their mind, they can throw off this idea of God, the idea that they are accountable to someone, that they have real freedom. But did you know that the majority of atheists, they really, really struggle. There's no hope in their life. I mean, if there is no uh, hope of afterlife, no hope of forgiveness, no hope of redemption, no hope of God, can you imagine what that's like to live that way? This is all there is. And let me tell you something. If this is all there is, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. If what we see in this world is all that there is, well, we don't really have that. So many people believe that the, I, that the way that to have true freedom is to throw off all restraint. It's actually the opposite. Because... True, real freedom, true, real love comes with the restraint of that love. I mean, for example, when you get married, um, you know, when, when Kim and I got married and we exchanged our vows, and, and I vowed that I was going to be committed to her for the rest of my life. You know what I did not do? There in front of God and all those witnesses in that church in 1986. I didn't start listing all the women that I was going to have to give up relationships with. Well, Kim, I'm going to go ahead and have to be with you, but I'm going to have to do this and this and that. No, in fact, I probably wouldn't be married to her today if, I, if I'd said that, okay? But this idea that real freedom comes with no constraint, the fact is, The love in my life, the joy in my life, the the wonderful nature of our marriage has been because there was the constraint of love. You know what the Bible says? The love of Christ constraineth us. What does that mean? It means it draws us in. It means it helps us. It means it propels us forward. It's not binding, it's freeing. But this man lived in this idea that he simply was not under any control of any kind. No constraint of any kind. Well, let let me read on. Down in verse 15. uh, A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. And he was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane. And they were all afraid. But Jesus said, now go, go home 
to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things that Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them to do. Now, once again, you got the choice. This demonic oppression, this one that he lived an unfettered life. He lived a life that no chain could hold him back. And he was, man, he was isolated. He was depressed. He was alone. It was awful. But when he met Jesus, and Jesus delivered him, notice what happened. He was delivered. His life was changed And he became a witness about what Jesus had done in his life. And you know, that's how you and I are to live. Oh, you're not going to be perfect. But in case you're wondering, nobody likes to hear a person pretend to be perfect anyway. If a person that is a Christian or claims to be a Christian, they start talking about how good they are, how much better they are uh, than everyone else. Nobody wants to hang around that person. Nobody wants to hear that. You know why? Because we know that we're all imperfect. But when a person begins to talk about what Jesus has done for them, how he has delivered them, people want to hear that story. You know why? Because they need delivering too. So this first person was demon-possessed. The second person I want you to see, and we won't be as long on these last two people, but the second person I want you to see was a religious person. A religious person. One was an immoral, demon-possessed person. Shows how Jesus can deliver from that. But also a man who was a religious person. And, you know, Jesus has the power to deliver you from fear. He can deliver us from darkness like he did the demon-possessed man, but then he can deliver us from fear. Now, the truth is, I believe this man was a follower of Jesus. Now, he was certainly religious, although that doesn't make you a Christian. But I believe he was a Christ follower because he was willing to identify with Christ publicly. And he demonstrated his faith in Jesus. But I want you to see something. He had a fear. He had a problem. Even as followers of Jesus Christ, we can deal with fear. And we can deal with problems in our life. And what was his problem? His problem was his daughter was sick. She was about to die. In fact, she did die. And we read in the story that Jesus came and raised this girl back to life. So Jesus has the power not only to deliver us from darkness, but to deliver us from our fears that come in our life. Mark chapter 5, verse 22 Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her so she and heal her so she can live. You see, Jesus has the power to deliver you from what ails you, from what causes you fear. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God did not give us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of self-control. On the one hand, you have a man that was demon-possessed. He was far from God. He was immoral. He lived with no constraint in his life. He lived out of control. And on the other hand, you had a man that had his life together. I mean, according to what everybody looked at, he was the leader of the synagogue. A religious man. No doubt a moral man. And yet, he had problems too. He needed delivering too. And so Jesus delivers us from our darkness, and he can deliver us from our fears. Well, we read on, if we had time, we could read the rest of the chapter, but we find out that Jesus actually went to his house, and they came out and reported that the little girl had died. Jesus told them, he said, don't fear, just believe. Don't fear, just believe. And they laughed at him because he said that, Oh, she's just sleeping. But Jesus went in and raised this little girl from the dead. And here's what I know. No matter what your fear is, I don't know if there is anything that could be worse in the life of a parent than the death of a child, especially a little child. Can you imagine the heartache that this man, this mother, can you imagine the fear that they went through? 
Can you imagine the terror of facing life with this kind of loss? Well, what I know is that Jesus has the power. And He delivers. And He can deliver us from our fear. And then the last person I want you to see is, and here's the point, Jesus has the power to deliver you through suffering. Not just from it, but through it. This last person was a woman who had hemorrhaged for 12 years and she had spent all of her money, but she didn't get better. And she said, if I can just go touch the hem of his garment, I can be made whole. And we we pick up Mark chapter 5, verse 26, and I want you to see this, that it says about her, she had suffered a great deal. Maybe you've suffered a lot. Maybe... Maybe you're in the middle of suffering right now. But notice what Jesus said, verse 34. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Now here's what I know. Jesus has the power to deliver us from suffering. But it's more likely that he's going to deliver you through suffering. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, it'd be nice if, as a believer, you never had to suffer at all. But that is just simply not life. It's not reality. And God does have a purpose for your suffering. Don't let your suffering be wasted. Listen to what it says in Job chapter 36, verse 15. You know the story of Job, right? Job was a very wealthy man. He's a very powerful man, a very influential man. And he lost everything in one day. Even lost his kids. And... Yet, here's what Job said. I want you to get this. Job 36, verse 15. But by means of their suffering, he rescues those who suffer. For he gets their attention through adversity. Did you get that? God makes you better through suffering. It is by means of your suffering that he rescues you. Isn't that amazing? You see, God doesn't want to waste your suffering. He wants your suffering to get your attention on Him. He wants your suffering to get you to focus on Him. And and that would be what my challenge would be for each of us today. Is that through our suffering, that we don't allow it to throw us for a loop. That we don't allow it to make us quit. But we allow it to make us focus our attention on Jesus Christ, because it's through suffering that he'll make you better. It's through suffering that you'll get stronger. It is through suffering that he will get glory from your life. And that is my prayer for every Christian that hears this message. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us all today. Lord, to realize that sometimes we're in a place of darkness and sometimes We're in a place of fear, and sometimes we're in a place of suffering. But Lord, I pray that you deliver us through them all, and that through your power, that you would get glory in our lives. In Jesus' name, I pray. Now, before I finish my prayer, I wonder if you're watching online, maybe you need to receive Christ as your Savior. Maybe you're in the room and you need to do this, but today, you're watching online, you'd say, Pastor Richie, I need to receive Christ. Why don't you pray something like this? Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I'm giving myself to you today. And I'm asking you to save me. And I hope that you will uh, help me as I go forward. If you prayed that prayer today, receive Christ, just mark it at the bottom of the screen as you watch online. Or if you're in the room, Fill out the next step card and uh, drop it in the uh, drop box on the way out today. Maybe today the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about something else. Maybe he's speaking to you about delivering you from that feeling of isolation, that feeling of depression, that feeling of darkness. Or, Or maybe there's a fear in your life. Or maybe you're suffering and you need help. My prayer for you today is that you will turn to Jesus because he has the strength and the power and the will and the ability to deliver you. 
at the end of the service, there will be someone up front uh, at the prayer table if you'd like to come pray. A prayer team member will pray with you. If you want to take communion, you can come take communion. And whatever your prayer needs are, we'll be here to help you. Also, if there's anyone that is interested in, in uh, getting more information about this mission trip to the Dominican Republic, you can meet me up front right after we're dismissed. Father, thank you for the joy, the power, and the blessing of knowing Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you. Thank you for being here today. You're dismissed. And we'll see you next, next week, next service, this Wednesday, whenever I see you. We'll see you when we see you.